Hello, and welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Preetha Ghosh, and I'm a partner here at Prime Movers Lab. Um, I've been here for six months, and prior to this, I worked at a federally funded research and development center uh, supporting the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Um, since I've joined, I've worked on a bunch of topics, primarily in climate and materials, um, since I have a background in chemistry and chemical engineering. Um, and for the last few months, I've been working with Marissa on uh, the topic of computer vision and the environment. Um, I will hand things off to Marissa in a bit. Um, but first, I wanted to welcome our audience, um, our limited partners, founders, anyone in the external uh, extended Prime Movers Lab family. Um, if you don't know us, we are an early stage venture capital firm. We invest in breakthrough science that has the potential to change billions of lives and for the better. So uh, we have six broad areas that we invest in. These are energy, transportation, infrastructure, manufacturing, human augmentation, and agriculture. Those are purposefully broad. A, a lot of times, you know, topics, uh, a, a startup may fall amongst many of those areas. And again, because they are so broad, we really like to do deep dives on a specific topic um, and bring a little bit more of a research lens to, to get an understanding of what's happening there. And so that's when we work with a fellow like Marissa in this case on the topic of computer vision for climate or the environment, I should say. Um, before I hand things off to our panelists to introduce themselves, I just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. We have an hour here and um, we'll try to keep to that and feel free to ask your questions uh, either via the chat or the Q&A function. We are super excited to uh, work them into the flow of our conversation. And with that, I am going to hand things off to uh, Ikino, since you are at the top of my screen here. Um, would you please introduce yourself? Thanks, Preetha. Yeah, I'm Egino Cafiero. I'm, um, historically, I was one of the founders of Bear Flag Robotics um, and also you know, the CEO of Bear Flag Robotics. Um, as a startup, Bear Flag built autonomous technology for farm tractors. Um, so we wouldn't build the tractor themselves, We'd um, you know take bring bring tractors in um, from customers or dealerships or whatnot, add the um, sensors and compute necessary to make them autonomous, and then deploy them back to growers as a service. Um, very happily, in 2021, we were acquired by John Deere, um, which allows us to expend, extend the impact of our mission um, more broadly to the four corners of the world. And so now I work um, at John Deere developing autonomy for tree nut orchards, um, specifically in California. Um, our home state, which is really exciting. Thanks, Preetha. Thanks so much, Yugino. Next on my squares is Matt. Matt, would you please introduce yourself? Sure. Hi. Uh, thanks, Preetha. I'm Matt King. I'm the CEO and founder of Fruit Scout. Um, uh, I first got involved with computer vision, well, in the last century uh, at this little company here in Seattle called Boeing. Uh, and somebody came up with this brilliant idea. Uh, let's take a camera and put it on the assembly line and measure the widgets, measure the process of manufacturing. Uh, and what Fruit Scout is doing is bringing that out into the orchards here in Washington, uh, as well as into other crops in other areas. But the idea is, look, a, an orchard or a vineyard or a field is a manufacturing facility, and we can apply the same concept. The technology is very different, same concept, to managing a process in agriculture using computer vision. Thanks so much, Matt. And finally, uh, Scott, I will please introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. My name is Scott Larson. I'm the CEO of a company called uh, Space Alpha. We are a uh, Earth observation uh, company that builds technology, which allows you to take pictures of Earth from space. Uh, this is my third space startup. My first one, uh, we had cameras on the International Space Station. We exited out of that. I exited out of that in about 2015. We took it public. Uh, second satellite company was building out uh, uh, satellite communications, and we sold that uh, three or four years ago to another U.S. satellite operator. And then we started building this company about two and a half years ago, and we build uh, what's called synthetic aperture radar, which is basically a large flat panel, kind of six feet by 18 feet. You mount it to the bottom of a satellite, and it sends down an electrical pulse. 
the pulse hits the ground, it bounces back up, and then the reflection is interpreted into an image. And because it's electrical pulse, you can see at night, you can see through clouds, you can see through weather, through storm, through rain, through things like that. Um, we can see things kind of as wide as about 200 miles. So that's kind of our swath. And then we can see things also as small as about 40 centimeters. Uh, we operate in, in uh, two different bands, X and L band. Uh, the X gives you the high resolution. The L is the environmental band. So we can track agriculture, um, pH balance in, in crops. We can tra track elevation change down to the millimeter level in the ground. And you can see this all from space. And so I think from a uh, Earth observation uh, standpoint and just being able to take pictures of Earth from space, we operate at kind of a wide scale anyway. So we'll dig into that a little more, of course, but uh, synthetic aperture radar from space. Thank you. I'm so excited about this, this group, as I mentioned just before we started, because literally the perspectives are so different, um, both in terms of where cameras are and just what we're even looking at. Are we looking at electro-optical? Are we looking so that at synthetic aperture radar? So I'm, I'm really excited about this conversation. Um, I now want to hand things off to Marissa um, to introduce herself and also the, the context and the ideas uh, behind this deep dive. Oh, thank you, Preetha. Um, so I'm Marissa. I'm a research fellow here at Prime Movers Lab and a final year PhD student at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm co-appointed to the Berkeley Artificial Intelligence Research Lab and also Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, um, where my dissertation work is focused on exactly this, computer vision and the environment. Um, so in particular, I look at using images and video to build 3D geometries of the world around us so that we can do scientific simulation. Um, and so in dreaming up this deep dive into computer vision and the environment, I wanted to see how trends that I've been witnessing in academia are playing out in the startup landscape. Um, so when you read most papers on computer vision and, and sometimes even just artificial intelligence more broadly, they tend to be motivated by the same set of problems. You hear a lot about autonomous vehicles, warehouse robotics. Um, augmented reality, virtual reality, photo editing, graphics, these types of things. Um, but we know that these are not the only sources of massive amounts of visual data and impactful problems to solve. Um, I think you'll see that we are collecting data from, from many sources, from um, Earth observation, from iPhones, from um, uh, autonomous robots are constantly collecting visual data about the world around us. Um, so in my work in academia, I think we're starting to see more scientists get a hold of these um, data sets and start to apply the, the cutting edge techniques in computer vision to uh, get the answers they need about this. And over the past few months, Preetha and I have also been talking to dozens of companies um, in this area trying to do the same thing. Um, and that goes everywhere from the data collection to the data processing and then turning that into actual actionable intelligence. Um, so that kind of sets the stage of, of what we're here to talk about. Um, we're wishing to explore visual data in the natural world and how we're using that to solve our environmental challenges. Um, so each of our panelists provides a unique perspective on this um, and different parts of that problem. And from there, I'll pass it on to Preetha to talk about, you know, why, why is this the most exciting time? Thank you, Marissa. It's It's been such a pleasure to have your academic background um, as we've had these conversations. It's, yeah, the, it's been very fun. Um, with that, I wanted to um, start off, as Marissa said, with this question of why now? Um, specifically, as she mentioned, you know, computer vision has been this buzzword in autonomous vehicles, you know, um, AR, VR, robotics. Um, why do we think that now it's starting to expand beyond those specific areas. Um, I'd love to, yeah, just lay that question out for you. Well, I can, I can jump in there. I think the, the, the fundamental answer is the technology has reached the place that it's practical or and commercially viable to do. Um, you know, you talk about the living world, and for us, it's agriculture and plants. Well, unlike it, in manufacturing, this is old. We've been doing this for 30 years, but a wing spar or a rivet doesn't change, change shape and color. Plants change shape and color, and it's a much more difficult computer vision problem. Um, and the small object side piece of this, um, that's still, we're pushing the cutting edge there. 
So the technology is just now reaching the point that we actually can parse the data that's coming in on these kinds of objects. Yeah, um, Matt and Preetha, just to just to build on that thought, um, you know, we started Bear Flag, started talking about Bear Flag in you know 2015, 2016, um, and even back then, you know, companies like Cruise were starting to, um, you know, um, gain, um, you know, gain um, popularity, and folks were starting to, you know, we were we were in a hype cycle of autonomous driving. It was going to be here in two or three years, and we're still sort of waiting on that, right? Um, but at that point, um, we were thinking the time is right because it's confluence of sensor prices and um, research coming out of institutions similar to um, what Marissa is working on. Hey, like we're starting to we're starting to feel like this is this is ready for industry. Um, and then you add in some other, um, and then we fast forward here to 2023, and you add in other factors like um, you know folks are you know basically everyone has mobile devices to command and control you know, smart machines on their farm, be it, be it drones, be it smart irrigation, be it, um, you know, solar uh, maintenance and inspection. And of course, in our case, you know, autonomous equipment. Um, and then the complementary, um, the complementary technologies to that, which is um, connectivity or even, you know, satellite connectivity, which is emerging now. Um, and that's sort of the supply side. Um, and that's, that's one part of it, but really the demand side is the other part. And I, I speak for what I know and not um, not the not the um, expertise of the other panelists, but for us, if you look at specifically California agriculture, um, there's two fundamental issues that California farmers face. Um, one is water, um, and we're indirectly addressing that accessibility and availability of water, but the other is labor. Um, and the simple fact is there just aren't enough folks interested in working in ag to make the economics of California agriculture work. Um, for, for many good reasons and many troubling reasons, um, we just have a massive scarcity of labor. And so, um, you know, autonomous tractors endeavor to increase the productivity index of the existing farm labor force, um, which is massively needed by farmers um, and by consumers of food. And so, um, in a word, what we have is this connection of um, ability to deliver the technology um, and the ecosystems in place to deliver the technology and the massive demand from farmers for the technology. Um, and we're we're reaching we're reaching that um, apex right now. Yeah, I think just to add to that, it's it's I mean, everything we're doing here is hard, of course. And so in order for this to work, whether you're taking pictures of crops or whether you're taking pictures of earth with space, of course, a bunch of different things have to kind of line up at the same time. Certainly the technology um, you know, just to a point where it makes sense. And then as uh, as we heard, just also the demand side. So from our standpoint, we are truly dual purpose technology. It serves both the government as well as commercial insurance, agricultural environment markets. Um, and so those two things kind of have to line up. And then and on top of that, it, it, you know, from a company that is a uh, new stage company, uh, satellites are going up, up in a couple of years. Um, it comes down to financing and funding. And so I think the shift from investors looking to you know, fund software, SaaS companies, more towards deep tech, hard tech, future tech, the, some of the things that Prime Movers does, it, um, those, those things kind of line up and they support hardware manufacturing type companies that you, or companies like us that use hardware to service something. So I think you need to have a bunch of different dynamics that all line up at the same time and support uh, some of the things that we're trying to do here. Well, I'll emphasize what, <laughs> what you're talking about, the demand side here. It's it's easy to underestimate the demand, but you know we're we're working with growers in Central America and South America as well here in North America, and the labor problem is the same. Uh, the, the costs are a little different down there, but it's still labor constraint. And you think about it, agriculture is probably the oldest industry, and they've done things a certain way for thousands of years. And that way was anytime they had a problem, throw labor at it. That was how it was until 20 years ago. And now that is no longer it. You look at what's going on in a lot of industries. I mean, in the strawberry world, they're now building the benches to grow strawberries up higher so that labor doesn't have to bend over. They're actually designing orchards so that autonomous vehicles can fit in them. This is a complete re a reversal of the way agriculture thinks. And they are now trying to solve that labor problem. And why? Now, this is the biggest problem in human history and is the biggest problem 
of the moment, how do we feed the next generation? If we techies do not give growers better, better tools, everybody's not going to be eating. That's the demand that's really driving this. Yes, that is um, spot on. And as Scott mentioned, it's so well aligned with what Prime Movers is interested in. That's that's part of why we, we were interested in this topic. Um, I want to keep things broad, but step to a slightly different angle of this, which is um, the concept of this being a new phase of visual data collection. So going back to the data of, okay, th there's there's demand, but how how are we entering into the, is, or are we entering a new phase of visual data collection? Um, and, and how does that play into this, this growing demand? Yeah, Preetha, I can, I can jump in here. I think, um, so this is a really exciting question and topic. Um, and um, I, I know I'm going to get carried away. So I want to, I want to hedge it um, in a very important place. Like as startup folks know, um, or perhaps as, as folks would agree, product market fit is the most important thing for any startup or any company. You need to be building something that people want. Um, and what we identified as Bearflag is um, what folks want is help with their labor problem today. And so we built technology for tractors to go through the field and um, mimic or, and do a job as well, better, or frankly, like even just adequately um, instead of a human. Um, and that was what growers wanted and what they were willing to pay for today. Now, the exciting part, um, and being careful not to skip that first step, is that once you have those tractors in the field, once you have those tractors running through the field with their LIDARs and their cameras um, and their other sensor modalities, maybe radar, thermal imaging, you're getting all this information from the crops around you, from the actual environment you're going through. And if you look at uh, you know, a crop like orchards, which, um, you know, Pat's also familiar with, um, you have this canopy that includes um, GPS. And so you necessarily need to put even more sensors on to overcome um, some of those, some of those more challenging robotics problems. But we're getting mounds and mounds of data, which we can then use to help inform other decisions around the farm. So we can monitor crop growth or identify, um, you know, disease earlier, or even with the water thing, identify where we need more water, or perhaps even more impactfully where we need less water, um, which would be um, fundamental. Um, so keeping in mind, it's super important to address the farmer's needs today. You can't just go sell them this, this sort of widget that may or may not help them in a decade. But what we can start to do while we're delivering value today is build this data set around how we're going to deliver value tomorrow. And that's really exciting. Um, we, we call it superhuman features. So what can the tractor do that a human can't do or can't easily do? Um, and so um, um, that's that's been that's been our focus um, and, and really um, one of the more exciting non-intuitive parts about what we're building. I would say just to add to that, I mean, we um, data is an issue, obviously, not not only not having enough or not having enough data, but on the other hand, actually having too much data. We'll take about uh, 15 terabytes of data per day. So it's a huge, huge, huge amount of data. Some of it, of course, entirely irrelevant as the satellite orbits Earth, you're imaging stuff that perhaps no one cares about, or maybe even no one cares about today, but might be relevant in the future. But just, um, you know, the processing of that, the storing of that, what do you do with that data? How do you work your way through all that data? Um, to the question is, you know, as we get more data, uh, it, 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 it opens up other questions and other challenges, which you know, to the earlier point, I think some of those things are being solved now with you know, Amazon on the cloud and all the rest of it. But it is, I mean, it's a fundamental issue. Um, 10 or 15 years ago, they were, they were mailing out DVDs from satellite companies. So, you know, you sent in a fax and, and they'd come back and say, yes, here's your DVD of this location of whatever you wanted to image. And so now, of course, that doesn't happen. But uh, just storing data and keeping it current so people can download and, 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 and uh, are relevant at least from our perspective, is a um, it's an ongoing thing. It isn't quite solved. It's getting there, but it uh, certainly is a is a cost that we're waiting uh, to come down over the next few years. Well, I'm going to sound like a founder here, uh, which I am. But I think to understand the the level of change we're talking about, you got to look back at the history of it. Well, 
and I'm talking about all of history here, because data itself was invented in the Nile Valley when a crop supervisor carved the record of the crops onto a stone tablet. If you look at Egyptian mythology, the, the, the god of data, his children were math, writing, and civilization. And that's an allegory, but it's true. This is the beginning of data was in agriculture and collecting data from the crops. And really, though, for 5,000 years, it didn't change. Okay, and it became a paper tablet and maybe now an Apple tablet, but there's a human collecting data and writing it down. And what we're talking about here is changing that, that the computer is collecting the data. That's the level of civilization changing impact that we're talking about. But the key point, again, sound like a founder from the other side is product market fit, right? And too much data isn't useful. And data that you don't know how to use isn't useful. So the solution that we're all here looking at is how do we take this data and put it in the context of a business? It's not just about computer vision and measuring something, but it's measuring what the business is doing. For us, it's about process management, right? Yeah, the technology measures a tree, but really what we're focused on is looking at ma ma managing the process of growing to hit a very specific target. That's fantastic. I, I just wanted to add on a, to bounce off of something Gino mentioned, um, to zoom into this question a bit more, which is around um, how visual data and what you're collecting works in concert with other types of data. And, and what made me think about that was, you know, your, your, your anecdote about the GPS uh, getting occluded. Yeah, I, I, I'd love to um, just push us in the same vein on data and just think a little bit about how does what you're gathering in terms of visual data uh, sum up into something greater or pair up with other data sources? Yeah, um, it's um, it's such a it's such a good um, prompt and and super exciting. So um, if, if the audience cares to, um, it will come as no surprise. We're using um, some variants of SLAM algorithms, which basically understand um, they endeavor to understand where the tractor is based on what's around it. And the cool thing about orchards is you have a ton of stuff around you. And so in order to even move the tractor, we need to identify what trees are, um, you know, what their positions are, how big they are, and then as we move, how they change in our frame of reference. And so in through the process of getting the job done, in this case, it's going to be um, air blast spraying in almond orchards, this task that happens, um, you know, for many months of the year in California. By, by virtue of actually just doing the job, imitating what a human's done, we're creating these massive, what we call point clouds of these orchards that we're traveling through, not only in time, but we can then watch them over time. And so one of the one of the exciting things um, we're, we're doing, and I don't, I don't think I'm showing our hand too hard, this is sort of an obvious uh, roadmap, is we can start to track the trees um, individually over time. And so every pass you make, you can look at this tree. And this is something, um, you know, that Farmers, as as Matt mentioned, from you know the Nile Valley um, through deer for the last you know 100 um, 180 some years have been trying to do is track individual crops over time, and so you can click in and say like how you know an almond tree grows for 30 years, sometimes more than 30 years, and we're making 10 or 12 passes per year, so we can get this immense um, chronological sort of insight to how this tree has grown, and then compare that to other trees on the farm or other trees in similar areas or other areas. Um, and you start to have this really powerful, not to overuse it, data set around how crops are grown, um, which can which can further um, you know develop our thinking around most you know how to optimize that across any paradigm. So some of the most obvious ones are how can we increase yield, but then how can we um, minimize you know chemical inputs or minimize water inputs or minimize number of passes per year, and we can start to tweak our models to say tell me tell me what I need to do to achieve this end result in a way that. Um, farmers or humans have never really been able to do in the past. I think the um, one of the things about data course is you know, you're looking for two things. One is um, to kind of look at things right now, take an audit of how things are, and then at the same time use the data to, and especially when it comes to agriculture, to try to predict the future. 
And so being able to take different data sets, whether it's from space, aerial, drones, all the way down to the plant, you kind of blend those data sets and the customer uses that to, in fact, uh, try to predict the future. One of the things that uh, you do with space, of course, is you can image you know, all the farms in the Midwest every couple of weeks during the summer. You mash that together with other data like uh, you know, crop cycles, weather, amount of pollution in the ground, and the Ministry of Agriculture is trying to predict, do we need to import grain or can we export grain? And this is on a macro scale. Uh, we've had customers who uh, have called up and said they want to image all the factories in China. And they do it from space and they're, you know, of course, counting cars in the parking lot. And the more cars, perhaps, you know, perhaps the busier the or perhaps the busier the factory is, they take pictures of the rivers behind and the more pollution in the rivers, perhaps the more output, you know, the trains leaving, counting trains and things like that, the longer the train. And then they're uh, blending in um, social data. And if there's people tweeting or, you know, using so social media at 5 a.m., they're probably working three shifts. And you take all that data, you mash it together, and you predict the GDP of China. And the... Uh, and the predictions are far more accurate, of course, than anything that's coming out on the government level. And so just an example of what you can do when you're blending and kind of mashing different data sets to, in fact, try to predict the future, whether it's agriculture, environment, other government uh, purposes or, or what have you. Uh, that's that's exactly it. The, you know, the, the, the big play here is the data integration of the big data. You may have heard that catchphrase somewhere else before, but... You know, so for us, our second customer turned out to be Agave down in Mexico, and our product's really simple. Take an iPhone, take a picture of the Agave plant, and we tell them the weight and the size of the fruit is still inside it. So we are literally, not figuratively, we're literally the scale between buyer and seller to determine what they're transacting. But that's one data point, right? Now, now they know the weight. What they've asked us for is, all right, let's integrate that with the satellite data, integrate that with the drone data, integrate it with the weather data, integrate it with the soil data to build this much more comprehensive view of what is actually going on there, what's going on in their fields. Labor management becomes a piece of tracking, tracking the workers and what they're doing. But when you put this all together, the sum is greater than the, the whole of its parts. There is a, a, a flywheel effect to this data. Again, though, it has to be in the context of the business, or as Scott's talking about there, in, in the context of measuring the GDP of China. There has to be an objective. There has to be this overriding goal. It's very easy and very tempting for us to get in the rabbit hole of it's cool. All right, yes, but what, what's the value of it? What's the purpose? What is the business objective or the scientific objective? And does it support that? But what you what we find in every case is, yeah, working with the neighbors to take their data and put it together with our data, there, there's a lot of benefit to that. I think one of just uh, yeah, one of the things that is still tricky. I mean, you know, in spite of where the technology has come over the last 10, 15 years, as we've talked about, is actually blending different data sets, just you know. It, it's complicated. It's still not really done properly, in my opinion. Uh, people have tap danced around it, say it's been solved, and and it is getting there for sure. It's getting there, and it better that you know certainly it's better than it was when you mailed out DVDs. But just blending different data sets from different sensors at different scales, wide area, you know, all the way down to the plant, is not simple. No, and I don't think it's been done properly, at least in uh, ways that we've seen. But it's 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 coming. It just it's incredibly complex. That is a, a perfect point on which to hand things off to Marissa. Um, Marissa, can I, yeah, can you uh, yeah. go on with your questions? Yeah, I'd love to dig deeper into some of this data. Um, but before we do that, I think I've heard a whole bunch of different perception sensors that you all have mentioned, right? We have um, RGB, just camera, visual data, but also um, depth data, LIDAR data, the SAR imagery, um, and a few others. So could we just start out by kind of giving our audience um, a landscape of some of these perception sensors out there? And what are the ones that you use? Um, what are the, the cost differentials? What are the value you're getting out of them? Um, and what do you think the trends are? I think like we're able to get a lot more out of an RGB um, camera than we used to. And some folks are deciding to just get rid of the LIDAR altogether. 
these types of trade-offs? Where do you all see that going? Yeah, this is um, this is um, my opinion is uh, exceedingly biased, and it, I feel like we have this. I, I feel like we have this conversation um, weekly, if not daily, internally. Um, it's a it's a fast moving space. I think uh, just you know for for listeners, we can broadly categorize sensors into passive and active sensors. Um, so passive will be like your RGB cameras, anything that sort of um, gets energy from the outside world, and active will be more like time of flight sensors. So your radars and lidars that will um, proactively go. Um, you know, go bounce off objects. Time of flight, generally speaking, are better for mixed lighting conditions, right? So they're um, more immune to nighttime operations or low light or, um, you know, uh, dawn or dusk conditions or shadows and things like that. Um, they just don't provide the resolution um, that an RGB um, camera would. And so you can get more, um, more positive object identification or, you know, superhuman features um, from those RGB cameras. Um, I, I'm of the opinion, um, and I speak for myself personally that we don't have a silver bullet sensor um, in any machine that will lead, meet, you know, quality and safety standards um, of a product that we would release into the world. Um, we'll need at this point in time a culmination of many different sensors to achieve that. I do see a point in the future where we have a, a unifying sensor that can do all things at all times, um, but but we're not there. And even if even if those do exist in sort of um, you know one-off forms or there's some promising science right around the corner. Um, you know, and once again, I speak for myself, we're in the business of delivering value today, and we should focus on other things like what um, the implications of these sensors on compute power or availability um, or durability in production environments. Um, and all these questions come into play when we consider what sensors to use. Well, Scott's going to be a lot more of the sensor expert than, than I am here. I think when it, um, you know, we use radar course, um, it's in space, that adds a whole other dynamic. And when you talk about imaging Earth from space, you know, started 50 years ago, fully black and white, then moved into color, only optical. Uh, radar has been around for the last maybe 30-ish years on a um, kind of on a commercial scale, but typically only government funded. So it's only been in the last 15, 10-ish years where you have uh, commercial companies, startup companies who aren't basically defense contractors getting into the mix. Uh, what's a little bit unique about we, uh, what we do is we operate in kind of two different bands. So the X and L band. And so you're able to blend kind of the wide swath with, um, as well as the high resolution. And when you back to merging these data sets, when you, when you merge these two data sets, if you're imaging a force, as an example, the X band hits the top of the trees, bounces off, uh, the L band will penetrate through the trees into the biomass and, and in certain cases underground. And so you, you get to um, you know, see what's underground, you get to track water, things like that, broken pipes and so forth that, that, are, that are actually actually buried. I think um, where we go from here in terms of sensor development, I think is a little bit tricky. I think when it comes to hardware, um, you know, there might be, you know, certainly we're not hitting the laws of physics, but we're pushing up against them, to be honest. I think where the where the real um, breakthroughs will be in terms of uh, the algorithms and in fact what you do with the data. Um, one of the things when it comes to Earth observation, one of the issues has been you always, you know, you're imaging, you're you're only imaging things where you, if you know where they are. So you upload coordinates. I want to image these GPS coordinates. I want to image this farm. I want to image, you know, the Amazon, whatever it is. Uh, one of the things that we have in our technology is the is ability to basically use machine learning to uh, make the satellites smarter effectively. And so as the satellites fly in over an area, if the L band, which looks down and sees wide, sees something interesting, change perhaps, or elevation differences, or a bridge or a tunnel, or crops that have, you know, the look difference than it, than it than it did the last time, it's able to point the X band over to take a high resolution snapshot. And so um, computer vision that kind of gets smarter and starts to image what you want it to, as opposed to what is perhaps less valuable, which is often, often the case when you're talking about imaging Earth from space. And so just, you know, the, the, I mean, the hardware is tricky for sure, but actually just doing more with the data, uh, making the hardware, making the sensors smarter and, uh, and, and and try to improve the customer use case that way. 
I think that's a great point about, you know, collecting data. That's that's interesting, right? Because there's such thing as too much data. Um, going off of that, do you all see going into a direction of having more permanent camera infrastructure through stationary cameras or just constant earth observation? Or do you think that there are ways to, I guess, and then using like post-processing machine learning to figure out what's interesting out of that? Or do you a priori figure out what's interesting and then you know ask a user to take an iPhone photo or deploy your satellites um, to focus on a certain area? So, so how do you do that um, versus putting the cameras where you think the, the interesting thing is or figuring that out later? Well, I think we're we're kind of the contrarians here because we're 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 pure software. We don't we don't build sensors. Um, but we do exactly what you're talking about. We figure out what is needing to be measured. Well, it turns out if you're measuring the process in an orchard, that always involves a human being. And so our business approach here is let's let's use that phone in their pocket. Apple's done a great job building a sensor. Apple's done an even better job of marketing and selling that and getting that sensor to where it needs to be, where the worker is. And so we hitch a free ride, both in capital and in labor, on the worker. They go do a task, they take a picture of that, and we analyze it, give them the feedback on the task. So the technology is measuring the tree, but what's actually interesting to the business is the work that they did. And so that's our approach. And there, there's plenty of others who are doing different things. And obviously, if you're trying to hemic an autonomous vehicle, you need sensors on a vehicle. If you're trying to do stuff from space, you need hardware. But what we've selected for our business strategy is to be pure software. And you look at our competitors, which are not these guys, uh, not my panelists, you know, we, we say they they brought a hardware knife to a software gunfight. Good luck to them. Yeah, I think when it comes to satellites, of course, satellites are orbiting. And so, I mean, everybody wants 100% um, coverage over, over the entire world. It just, but when it comes to space, that's not possible because the satellites, frankly, are, are, are orbiting. And so then it comes down to uh, revisit times, you know, doing some analysis on um, how much can we afford based on space is expensive, satellites are expensive, hard launches are expensive. And so uh, trying to come up with a sweet spot between how often do we need to image versus, you know, the value of the data, you know, customer return, all the rest of it. But um, it, typically, everybody wants 100% imagery coverage over the entire world. It just it's just not possible, and it's and it's probably never going to be possible. Or certainly not possible for a long time. And so, from an Earth observation standpoint, you just kind of hoping for the best, coming up with the best use case, trying to figure out the way that um, will give the most data to the broadest number of customers which obviously includes government. And so, you know, governments come in and often are the anchor customer, and then you service the commercial sector and the agriculture environment and, and, and you know, shipping and so forth after that. But you're, you're trying to find the balance between those, things, those two things. Um, great. I think one thing that we've been hearing a lot in, in AI right now is um, about foundation models, right? So I think we're finally there with language where now you have something where you can just talk about anything with that model. Um, where do you think we are in terms of vision? Like, do you find, um, for example, um, and you know, working in the uh, orchards, like, can you very easily go from an orchard to another type of crop? Are you focusing on, on building a vision solution for a very specific use case, or do you go horizontal? How far away do you think we are from having something general purpose that we can use reliably? Marissa, what a, what a fantastic prompt. Um, the, the tension that I kind of alluded to earlier, like what is possible versus what is prudent and like what makes sense, right? Um, and where, where the value is. So um, even just like looping back super quickly to sensor selection, um, there's so many other things to consider, like maintenance of the sensor, the compute resources to power that sensor, the durability of the sensor, supply chain, um, assurances of that sensor. There's so many things that go into getting that sensor on a tractor, creating value um, that need that need to be considered. And so, um, you know, it it becomes a much more of a um, a pragmatic question than like a possibility question. Um, as as it should, we're here to deliver value. Um, when we think about the algorithms themselves. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a trap, right? Um, we sit down and we're like, hey, you know, what would it take to build a GPS denied solution that will work in almond orchards? Well, then what about walnuts? What about pecans? 
um, you know, what about citrus? What about stone fruit? Okay, great, great. Um, what about vineyards? Then like, let's look at broad acre. And what about shading on the edge of cornfields or wheat fields or other broad acre fields? And then like, well, this is working great. Deers in construction. Why don't we do construction too, right? And you can see how this snowballs very quickly. Um, and so, and so for us, you know, I'm, um, I consider myself, you know, much more of an operator than a technologist. Um, it's a, how can we get a reliable product in the field as soon as possible? And um, the trick there is narrowing the scope. Let's build, let's build a um, a piece of equipment that will work for a small set of customers and delight them, um, and then iterate to make it to make it broader. Um, early indications are that that won't um, that we will learn and be better over time, and so um, we'll get better returns on our investments um, going forward. But um, my opinion is that we need to focus narrowly now because this is not a solved problem. Um, and there's a lot of heuristics um, and a lot of you know cheat codes that we do use to deliver value. Um, and so rather than building um, you know the uh, the perfect solution first, let's uh, let's deliver value as soon as possible. Well, on the computer vision side, from our point of view, we do have a generalized solution for measuring plants. But to translate in that into biz, useful business data, that's the work we do that's different. And let me, very simple example there. To size an apple and to size a pear is the same for us. But an apple grower wants the longitudinal measurement, I'm sorry, the latitudinal measurement, while a pear grower wants the longitudinal measurement. So that's the work that we have to do. It's not on the AI, it's actually in the code to say, okay, which measurement do, is applicable to this grower? Which, which measurement is applicable to this step of the process? And that's, there is no general solution there. There is product development, UI development, front end work to build that control panel. It's different for each process. Going more on this kind of generalization topic, thinking not just about application, but but input data, I think Scott alluded to this a little bit earlier. Um, what are the challenges in dealing with all these types of data from a really small scale to a really large scale? Can you actually use them together? What does that look like? I know, Matt, you mentioned that you know, you're, you're dealing with an iPhone picture, but then people also want verification from the satellites. How do you get all these types of data to play nice? Um, are there still some open technological questions there? Oh, there's definitely open technological questions there. Um, but the real one, it's a UI question. How do you get that data to them? Uh, and I'll tell you, Archie, we're using Google Earth. It works great. And Google built a really nice tool there. We, if we can get all of that data integrated under the hood, presenting it to them in Google Earth works wonderful. Um, and then they love it. And it's kind of a magical interface. That, you know, they, there's this moment they go, oh. I see it. I get it. And that's the real goal there, right? It, there, there's a hard, there's lots of hard problems of cleaning the data and lining the data up and getting integrated. That, that, that's, that's the grunt word. But then there is, you can see it in their face. They just go, I get it. And that's, there's some magic to that. Marissa, this wasn't the, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, Scott, I'll, I'll make a brief point there. So you reach for the mute button. Um, Marissa, um, this wasn't the exact question, but I think there's something that can't be lost here. Um, and it comes back to delivering the value and the usability of the information. And Matt's on this. He gets it. Um, he's providing tools to folks who aren't technologists, who aren't roboticists. Um, and by the way, Matt, I, I think uh, um, just, I, I agree with your thesis completely. I, I Not even thesis. I agree that um, yield estimation is probably one of the biggest um, problems that growers face today. Like it creates this immense amount of waste. But in order to solve that, we need to give the tools to folks who um, are not technologists. The folks who are using it, we're not begging for um, the, you know, the, the, the tools that we're giving them. And so they need to be consumable. They need to delight the user. And um, I think there's a really underrated problem here where we build these incredible technologies um, and then give folks engineering interfaces to them. Yeah. Um, and that just that just fails time and time again. And so how can we build these incredible technologies and abstract away the complexity and deliver a delightful experience to a you know to a farmer, to a farm worker? Um, that's not an easy problem. Um, <laughs> um, I, I haven't I haven't used um, Fruit Scout personally, so I, I this is not in my data set. I haven't seen any ad companies do this remarkably well yet, um, including including my own. Um, it's one of the most underrated problems that we're trying to solve. 
Yeah, and it's the same issue from space. I mean, um, you know, space is a bunch of space geeks, and 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 what space geeks focus on, of course, is the satellites because the satellites are awesome and they're fun and they're going to be launched on SpaceX and all the rest of it. And so there are all kinds of examples of uh, satellite companies that built and launched satellites for all kinds of different reasons, whether it's Earth observation or for communication or for something else, but didn't really have a solution on how to get the data down first, or secondly, how to actually distribute it to customers uh, and either to sell it or whether you know, you're mailing a DVD or you're asking for a credit card still, they don't, um, you know, that, that aspect of it was often ignored just because from a um, tech standpoint and certainly from a space standpoint, it's much less intriguing than actually working on a satellite that's gonna go up to orbit. And so, you know, the business aspect of it, as Matt's mentioned a bunch of times, is often overlooked and is kind of second when it comes to this when it comes to this type of stuff because well the tech is kind of cool and I want to work on the cool stuff and you know working on the UI so a customer can log in and draw a little polygram around their area of interest is um, is what drives the business but is much less fun than than you know working on orbital dynamics if that's what you're into as an example. Hey, thank you so much. Um, thank you for geeking out on the data with me. Um, I'm now going to hand it out to Preetha to kind of go back into the, the bigger picture and start, talk about some of the future trends. That's exactly right. Um, I wanted to sort of throw a question out as we've been thinking about all of this different data we're collecting in different ways. How 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 do you each think about privacy in in these in these uh, in these very different uh, use cases? I feel like that's a question for me, but 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 maybe I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, yeah, when it comes to space, of course, you know, there's all kinds of government regulations uh, in terms of what you can image and what you can't. Um, but the list of what you can't do is actually very very small. So the UN's come up with regulations and, and you know, space starts at about 100 kilometers. So when you're 100 kilometers and up, that's considered outer space. And anybody can, in, in fact, take images of, of anybody else. Um, there's uh, rules about uh, shutter control, which is if you are imaging over a sensitive area, like a native, like a, uh, like a, like a, initiative in Eastern Europe, as an example, or some kind of NATO initiative or UN, UN initiative in, in Africa, as an example, the government has the right to ask you to turn the cameras off. They've never done it because they don't think it's legal. And, and they don't think it would pass the uh, Freedom of Information Acts. And so what Western governments do is they say, go ahead and image whatever you want, but we'll take all the data. We're going to buy all the data off you. And so you know, Eastern, Eastern Europe right now is a great example of that. Situations in Africa, another great example of that where, yeah, you can image anything you want. We're just, we're just going to go ahead and we have the right to buy all the data off you. And the reality is, is that, I mean, if, if, if you're if imaging San Diego Naval Base, as an example, from space, the data set that you're getting is much less um, granular, much less detailed than someone walking up to the edge of the naval base with a camera that you buy from Best Buy for a few thousand bucks and taking pictures of whatever you want. And so, you know, Earth observation would come, yeah, there are privacy issues, there's certainly security issues, there's, you know, there's, there's everything else. But in terms of when you break that down to what that actually means, it's, it's, it's much less invasive than a thousand other technologies that all of us use on any given day. Well, one, one of our VCs, one of our cousins, another portfolio company is a privacy company. And we, we have a, a kind of a riff because they give their presentation and they'll say, except for plants, because in a humorous way, you can say we are a surveillance system for plants. Well, plant privacy doesn't matter. Right? Obviously, everybody wants to know everything about the plants, but data ownership is a big deal. Um, and this is something I've dealt with in a couple of iterations before. And the way we approach this is. All right, we're, you're, you're taking pictures with a cell phone. Well, you're paying us to do that. It's like hiring a photographer for your wedding. You own the pictures. The customer owns the pictures right out, flat out. But we reserve the right to develop products with that. So we have all, you know, unlimited derivative use, and they like that. They want us to build better products. But then 
they also want us to sell their data. They want to sell the data to the insurance companies. They want us to take their aggregated data and sell it to Walmart. Now, there's there's some nuances there. They don't there's some specific stuff they don't necessarily want sold to Walmart. Fine. And balancing that, there's a balancing act there to, 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 to keep everybody happy. But we have found universally, multiple regions, multiple countries, multiple crops, they actually want that data shared because they get benefit from it. They want to share the data with their neighbors because they want to compare. They want to compare regionally. So there's there's aligned incentives for the data to be shared properly. And that there, there's some nuances and does need to be aggregated, doesn't need to be averaged out. They don't, they don't want you to share, you know, what 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 they did in their, their field today. But it's been very interesting. It's a, it's a different thing than in the human data side uh, what, of what, what the customers actually want. Yeah, farming is one of these interesting things. I agree. Um, Deer's, Deer's, Paul, uh, you know, Deer's policy is similar to Matt's, not, um, not quite the same, and I can, I'm happy to get into it. But um, something that was... Um, um, something that was pointed out to me is that farming is one of the only industries where you can basically see what's going on in the factory just by taking a drive, right? There's no, there's no actually privacy in like what's being grown or how it's being grown. And um, anecdotally, I know a lot of farmers in Salinas who will drive around the valley Sunday afternoon just looking and see what their neighbors are doing. Not yeah. only to like, not only to like understand how they're doing compared to their neighbors, but to know what they're growing because it affects market prices. Um, you know, there's a ton of um, game theory that goes into deciding what to grow. Um, the deer's policy, and this is where it differs a little bit from Matt's, is um, you know farmers' data is their data, um, and we're we're not um, you know we're going to sell it. Um, you know they they can do with it what they want, um, and we go to extreme lengths to protect farmers' data um, because it is their data. That makes a lot of sense to me. I I wanted to have one last um, question that sort of. Uh, I want to push us into into the future a bit more and, and get even speculative if you yeah. if you all desire. Um, how how do you think about incorporating you know other emerging technologies? You can talk about large language models or or really go beyond that. But are there other are there emerging technologies that you're excited about uh, incorporating um, in with computer vision and and yeah, just what what gets you excited about the next I don't know five to ten years uh, in this space? Yeah, from a from an Earth observation standpoint, um, and this goes back to kind of the sensors that we talked about before. You started with optical, and then and then it's kind of moved into radar, and you know the radar is getting better and bigger and stronger and all the rest of it. Uh, some of the new sensors coming out, and we've all heard about them, would be um, you know thermal taking pictures of you know heat patterns and um, uh, greenhouse gases. Of course, you can see that from space, which is which is interesting. And then you get into things like uh, multispectral as well as um, hyperspectral. So not just the three different bands that we can see with our eyes, but maybe 50 or maybe even 200 different bands. Mm -hmm. And so the use case there is both incredibly academic as well as purely military. It's, it's, it, it's kind of both ends of those spectrums. And so you can take a picture of a tank in the desert and determine if the paint on the tank is from China or Russia as an example, just because it has a different, just because it has a different reflection. And so, you know, that's only on the hardware side. And so, you know, you, you take that kind of data set, what do you do with it? How do you mash it together with other data sets, whether they're from space or of course from ground? And I think uh, just just new different data sets, blending them together, layering on social media, as we talked about 10, 10 years ago, that never ever, ever would have been a conversation. And now it's kind of automatic, of course you do that. Um, and rather than sending people out to count cars in Walmart's parking lots like they used to do in the 80s, now they do it from space at scale and use it to predict same store sales and you know Walmart share prices and all and all kinds of stuff. So um, different data sets mashed together, stuff that's been incredibly academic but is now moving into the commercial side is is uh, is going to be interesting over the next 10 or 15 years. Matt, I'll let, I'll let you get the last word because I have, I have a feeling you're going to you know leave us on a higher high than I will. Mm -hmm. um, when answering this question, I'm, I'm I'm kind of a pessimist in that, or maybe not a pessimist. That, that's the wrong word. I'm um, I think there's less like excitement around the form factor um, around the corner in agriculture. You know, um, tractor tractors are a, a, a thoughtful form factor. They're these 
heavy piece of equipment and they're necessary, they're power plants and they carry implements to do specialized jobs. And you can switch the power plant be behind, you know, the implement behind the power plant based on what you want to do. That's sensible. That makes sense. I think what we will see a major change in is how farmers interface and interact with those vehicles. And, um, you know, this isn't a new thought, um, but it's a thought that I really do appreciate today. Um, farmers interact with their tractors with their hands and with their with their land through the windshield of their tractors. And um, you can see a, a reality very soon tomorrow, the next day, where they're actually interfacing you know, through their cell phones or through their laptops or through their tablets. Um, and the implications there are massive. One, um, it's a more comfortable, um, you know, the, the longevity of your, you know, these are hard jobs and removing people from these hazard zones or the toil of of farm work is is important for them but then too if you consider it might be more like exciting thing for deer there's a especially in america there's a there's a a nostalgia or a um or a, a special sort of like feeling around green equipment and the the sort of feelings that the deer brand evokes and so for us how do we maintain that how do we give people the same sort of pride of ownership and pride in their craft when they're not sitting in their tractor but they're interacting um, through the screen. I think those are really exciting challenges um, to solve and um, certainly something that really pumps me up. Well, for us on the short term here, the, the new one is generative AI, right? Um, think about one of the problems we have. You're taking a picture of one side of the tree. How do you count the apples on the other side of the tree? And we've been using statistical models and with great success, but Generative AI really changes the picture there. Uh, and if you think about it from a business point of view, it moves the needle in terms of how much data you need to make an accurate prediction. So that's wonderful. But to go even bigger here, to me, if you think about what is computer vision, computer vision is the opposite of web technology, or the contrapositive, really. Web technology is about taking data and turning it into shapes and colors on a screen that a human can parse. Computer vision is about taking shapes and colors and parsing that into data. I think over the next 20 years or 50 years, we're gonna see that computer vision is going to have a bigger impact on the world and on technology and everyday life than the web has had, because this is a teaching computers how to understand what they see. And we're talking about it in the context of the environment and agriculture here, but the larger picture, this is, I, I think a thousand years from now, there's going to be an inflection point of pre-computer vision and post-computer vision. And that's it's going to be a bigger inflection point than we now look at before and after for the printing press. It's that level of societal change that this technology represents to us as a species. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a fascinating conversation. I want to thank each of you for sharing your insights from your very different perspectives. And also, I just loved watching you react to what the other person was saying. Again, you have such different vantage points that it's very fun to see what you inspire in each other. Um, Marissa, I wanted to, to hand it to you in case you had any closing thoughts. Um, no, that's all. Thank you all so much. I also really enjoyed this um, and look forward to, to see what's to come. Thanks very much.